It's September 12th, 1987. My name is Major Alan Schaefer, also known as Dutch, U.S. Army veteran, Special Ops Commander, and the only survivor of the Valverde incident. These tapes are my personal testimony. Insurance. Should anything happen to me, what I found won't be lost. My team was brought in to rescue a Guatemala cabinet minister and his aide, who had been captured by guerrilla forces in Valverde. We located the downed helicopter and the skinned bodies of those aboard, hung in nearby trees, seemingly at the hands of guerrilla fighters. After assaulting their camp, it became clear that the mission was a setup. American intelligence had sent us to retrieve the captured agents who had been on recon for future military action. But none of that matters, because while we were clearing out the guerrillas, something was hunting us. An invisible kill attracted us as we made our way to the extraction point. In 24 hours, it wiped out my entire team. Rick Hawkins, Blaine Cooper, Mac Elliott, Billy Soul, Jorge Ramirez, and Al Dillon, the best soldiers I've ever known. Men I trusted with my life were butchered like animals. It was a nightmare. We walked in with guns, but it had perfect camouflage, advanced weaponry, and could see heat. It was strong and smart, a pitiless hunter. I waited, I watched, and when I understood it, when I saw how it hunted, I killed it. As it lay dying, in a final fuck you, it activated an explosive device. I barely escaped that blast. My radiation sickness and the crater of the explosion are the only evidence it ever was here. I have given my official statement to Agent Peter Keys of the OWLF, but it's become clear. I needed to investigate Valverde myself. Keys was thorough, but he asked all the wrong questions. I mean, we have proof of alien life, but that life sees us as game. It's an alien whose first contact with humanity was to hunt us for sport. All Keys cared about was the technology lost in the explosion. He can see the jungle for the trees. I see the threat. He sees the opportunity. Spies are all the same. I mean, we aren't people to them. We are assets. How many soldiers would he feed to those monsters just for a chance to steal from them or to learn from them? The government can't be trusted. So I will have to do this on my own. I'm cutting my treatment short and going off the grid. I will make my way back to South America to Valverde. I was told that there were stories about demons who make trophies of man. I'd like to hear those stories. April 8th, 1991. I'm not dead yet. I'll admit, I regret not curing my radiation sickness before I left. It made leaving the country difficult. I cashed in a few favors took one too many off-the-book flights in rusted up buckets, but I made it back to Valverde. The area was on lockdown, sealed by American intelligence for study. The complex centered on a crater from the alien self-destruction. I found the scientists slumming in the local bar. A few drinks, a couple of threats later, he was ready to talk. It wasn't much, barely anything I didn't already know. The blast emitted a form of radiation they'd never seen before. Some believed it was extraterrestrial, some didn't. Either they're not too bright, or there's nothing to find. I decided to let them keep searching in vain. It kept them busy and off my trail. I've been touring villages and small towns using the cover of an author writing about South American folklore. I don't know if any of them bought in, but they took my money and told the stories. The closer they were to the jungle, the more stories of devils in the trees. Some were bullshit, made up on the spot, but some carried consistencies that I couldn't ignore. Whatever it was, the demons who make trophies of man, 
the devil of the trees or the skull taker, the stories always began on the hardest summer that they could remember. In the summer of 1987, Valverde, Valley broke its all-time high in temperatures. They loved the heat. It must remind them of home. Everything else confirmed the truth of the stories. Proud warriors skinned and hanged. Skulls and spines ripped from their bodies. Maybe it was obvious from the beginning, but it wasn't until I heard the stories that I truly accepted the purpose of these mutilations. I mean, they're taking trophies. They travel impassable distances to hunt us, skin us, and mount us over some alien fireplace on another world. It would be disgusting if it weren't so familiar. Where do I go now? It's been on my mind all year. The takeaway from all this intel is that they've been doing this for decades, centuries maybe. They're coming back, and I need to be there when they do. June 27th, 1992. It's hard to remember that the most important part of an operation is patience. You can plan the perfect op, but you can't account for everything. If shit goes south, there's nothing to do but to adapt and finish the mission. Sometimes you just get lucky. I was in the dark, ten clicks down river from the Valverde border, figuring out my next move. I was ready to pack it in. I mean, I thought that I learned everything that I could, that there was nothing left for me to find. The OWLF had abandoned the detonation site a year ago, and I thought that they already shipped back to America. That's when I saw Agent Peter Keyes tie his skiff to the dock. I mean, I haven't seen Keyes since I gave my official statement to him. It was impossible, but there he was, with three of his buddies. All agents. I mean, the clean, tidy outfits give them away all the time. I mean, they don't want to get down in the dirt, you see. That's what they pay soldiers to do. Keys walked up, looked right at me, and shook my hand. I mean, with the radiation sickness, I've lost a lot of weight, so I thought that he maybe would not recognize me, but... Then he greeted me like we were old pals. Keys is a good spy. Saying nothing, implying everything. We spent the next few hours trading war stories at the bar. If you had heard us, you would never have suspected that we were trading intel on an alien manhunter. <laughs> His cover was that they have been looking for a serial killer, a sadist who has been operating in the area for years hunting people like animals and then skinning them alive. Keys wanted to talk about the monster, so it all came out in the cover story. In many ways, they were just a few steps behind, surveying villages for information, locating witnesses. He did confirm one thing that only considered. He told me how the killer chose his victims. They were always armed. A rifle, a pistol, a knife in the boot. He wasn't taking kids or random villages. He wanted a challenge. Whatever it was, it was a hunter. When it killed, it killed for sport. I wish they were here for a military action, recon for an invasion, but the truth was so much worse. We are prey, animals, fit only to be hunted. Keys and his buddies paid the tab and mine, but before he left, he winked at me and he said, stay out of the jungle. That's where he gets you. I tracked Keys and his team for weeks, but they didn't learn anything new. Maybe they knew that I was there, maybe they didn't, I don't know. I've risked enough for now. I think it's time to disappear, keep my ear to the ground. <sighs> Be patient. March 3rd, 1996, Zaire. I thought I could wait. I thought that I could hold back and make my move at the right time. I couldn't. Fuck. I had to find them. 
I needed to hunt it or let it hunt me. I joined up with any private military company that was headed into the hot zone. I pulled every string, cashed out every favor just to follow the sweat and the death that attracted the demon. I eventually put together a team myself, lost soldiers and haunted men, willing to fight and to die wherever I led them. They thought that I was a legend. And I let them believe that. <laughs> I'm quiet and good in what I do. They needed them to see me as a legend so that they could take them to die in a sweltering jungle. We went on more missions than I can remember. We didn't fire until we were fired at. They thought that it was my code. It wasn't. I was waiting and watching. Our last mission was an Iwag up in the Congo. A private munition base had gone dark. When we arrived, they'd been dead for days. Bodies strung up on floodlights around the base, all of them skinned, some missing skulls and spines. We secured the site and waited for backup to arrive. In the heat of the day, I steered into the waves of heat coming off the concrete, thinking that any minute they might come alive as the invisible killer. And then they did. I didn't wait. I unloaded every round I had. Trusting me, my team fired in the same direction. It wasn't the first time I'd done it, but this time I knew what I was looking for. It was so fast, we couldn't hit it. We panicked, and stray rounds struck the crate of RPGs. And that explosion hit other munitions that exploded. By the time the smoke cleared, the demon was dead, but so were all my men. I took samples of its blood, pieces of its anatomy, and what tech that I could salvage. And then I burned everything. Then it disappeared. I never checked in mid HQ. As far as I know, I was counted among the dead. October 12, 1997, Los Angeles. I needed to come back to the States. It wasn't impossible to sneak a counterband through customs, but I wasn't willing to risk what I found in a Congo falling into the wrong hands. Instead, I traveled to Mexico aboard a cargo ship bound for the port of Altamira. From there, I made my way to Tijuana and I bunkered down. I had tangible proof of extraterrestrial life in my possession, but no idea what to do with it. I'm not a scientist. I did a soldier's duty and secured valuable intel. This was out of my pay grade. I kept an eye on the news. Los Angeles was having a record-breaking heat wave and a gang war on the streets. It was perfect. I could feel it in my bones. I'd been tracking them for so long, I could think like them. I could smell the prey. I could see the hunting ground. I had to get the LA. Crossing back into the States from Diamana wasn't that difficult, but by the time that I'd reached the city, it was already over. Like Valverde, the OWLF only found crumbs. What I'd hoped might be an alien ship turned out to be only a launching site. I wanted it too much, and I got sloppy. I breached the OWLF's quarantine and was captured. I'd hoped to be bailed out by Agent Keys, but he died. With keys gone, the OWLF was leaderless and disorganized. I was interrogated, but I negotiated my release by bartering the alien materials that I'd recovered from the Congo. During the negotiations, it was clear how little they knew. They needed someone who understood the threat so I offered to work with the OWLF as a consulting advisor. They had the funding, the technology that I needed to continue my hunt. I wouldn't work for them, but I would work with them. 
There will be a weapon that I can use to hunt down these predators as they move to fresh ground. It's only a matter of time until they see us as a real threat. When the prey can fight back, it's no longer a hunt. It is war. March 3rd, 2008. We've gotten good at killing predators. Every time we find one, we come back with more tech, more research, and the OWLF's funding goes up. Together, we have gotten stronger and more efficient. For a time, the aliens were surprisingly predictable. They had no idea that we knew so much about them. But that began to change. They sent better hunters every time. They're beginning to see us as a threat. Or we've become a more worthy prize. Maybe both. We know this because our last encounter was special. We weren't certain if they had any gender to speak of, but that changed when we came into contact with the female. She was smarter and deadlier. She didn't fuck around like the males did. She was direct, ruthless, and skilled. I was in Laos when we first came into contact with her. It was Valverde all over again. Her ambush wiped out my entire team. Only this time, she got me. In a small village, I lost track of her, just long enough for her to pin me with a razor net. Pinned against the wall, razors cutting into my face. I've been fighting for so long, I was ready to die. I should be dead. Instead of making the kill, she cloaked and vanished into the jungle. The net relaxed and I escaped with my life and a scar to remember her by. She spared me, only me, like she knew who I was. I returned to the exfil, my first failed mission in a long time. Are we going about this wrong? I mean, we've learned so much, but in doing so, have we made ourselves a bigger target? I can't stop thinking about something Napoleon said. You must not fight too often with one enemy, or you will teach them all your art of war. I started this believing that we were learning how to hunt them, or maybe she let me live to just be hunted another day. We were teaching them how to hunt us. January 13th, 2019. I knew that the Predator's deployment to Earth would make it impossible to keep all of this a secret. Sooner or later, there would be another player on the board. I'd hoped that it would be another agency, one that understood and respected the threat. Project Stargazer. <laughs> Our initial intelligence on Stargazer was that they were capable, funded, but inexperienced. But they were smart. They took the OWLF's funding and got it shut down. Everyone we could identify in their group was a disavowed member of another agency, including the OWLF. Lacking strong leadership and a clear directive, they were sloppy and arrogant. They were aware of the predator's threat, and while they had many of the pieces, they struggled to see the bigger picture. Stargazer was so far behind that we didn't see them as a threat until the event in Mexico. The recovered predator escape part was an extraordinary find for Stargazer, but the death toll was a heavy price to pay for taking a predator captive. My task force has many directives, but one of the most primary is we do not take captives. Retrieve technology, corpses, and other intelligence. But there's no value in a live predator, only liability. The enemy does not want peace, the enemy does not negotiate. Its only drive on Earth is to hunt. What we may learn from a captive predator would never be worth the risk to our people. Stargazer didn't learn from their mistakes, and the technology they've recovered has only made them cocky. 
when the government cut ties to the agency, it should have shuttered the project permanently, but they only shifted their goals. Guerrilla factions and private military companies are being contracted by Stargazer to set up bases and equipment in locations that we have identified as ideal hunting grounds. We believe that the former intelligence project is setting itself up to be a fully independent dealer of otherworldly arms. This is the worst case scenario. Hostile forces will use those weapons on their enemies and they will use them on us. All the while, the true enemy stalks us unseen. It's a distraction mankind can't afford. Stargazer would have to be dealt with. 2025. It's hard to believe that I'm still here recording this. <laughs> I probably shouldn't be smoking in the med bay, but fuck it, it's my birthday, for Christ's sakes. I turned 78 today, but I'm out there hunting. <laughs> I should be retired. I should be doing anything but this. My life shouldn't be possible. But the very thing that I hunt, that hunts me, is what's keeping me alive. As we began to understand the predator's technology, we started to use it. A fight with a predator female went bad and I was critically wounded. Dying, I agreed to experimentation. It worked. It worked so well that the cells in my body stopped aging. Pushing 80 now, I'm fighting like a man in his 40s. It's not the only experiment that I've been part of. I am deadlier now than I was in Valverde. The OWLF has been fully reinstated. It's grown larger than ever before. We saved John Keyes from Stargazer. His father was Peter Keyes. I suppose you could say that he was a very dear acquaintance. His son is a gifted scientist. I worry about the future. The Earth is seeing unprecedented rise in heat and war. As the climate changes and the temperatures go up, more and more countries are becoming hunting grounds. We have killed so many of their kind, but they only sent more. The number of events that we have witnessed has increased threefold in ten years. We have made an impression on them, but not like we had hoped. We wanted to show them that we weren't prey to deter them from ever sending another hunter to our world. We sent a warning, but they took it as a challenge. I fear we have made things worse. If the predators ever decide that we've grown too bold, I have no doubt that they could burn the earth and all of humanity with it. My only hope is that while they waste their time on sport, we can rise up together and stand against them as a species. Until then, we keep moving, we keep hunting, and we keep our eyes open.